when we imagine Europe 800 years ago. We need to think perhaps of the Venetians who were trading with China, or the Parisians who had founded their first university. But then we need to focus on the little area of marshy nothingness, where the Amstel River fed out to the eye, a windswept corner of northern Europe beyond the edge of the old Roman Empire, where water was king and the people were just visitors. Now, in this little corner, there was the Amstel River leading to the sea, but a group decided to dam it, to make Amstel a dam. And there, according to myth, they met a bird, a heron, who talked to them about their small hamlet, saying, your houses will become a hamlet, the hamlet a village, the village a town, the town a city, and the city will one day rule the whole world. Pure fantasy and myth, but perhaps all civilizations who become powerful and influential reach for myths to explain the story of why that took place. In reality, of course, we know it's more complex that these stories are driven by physical geography, the actions of regional neighbours, the ideas that come to hold sway among the people who live in these places. For Amsterdam, these factors were to make the city the richest within Europe within 500 years and to be arguably the most controversial within 300. And so it is that we arrive at our location, 2021 Amsterdam. What we want to invite you to do through this lecture is to join with us on a tour of the city and also a tour of ideas, the ideas that have formed the modern world, which in many ways can trace their roots back to Amsterdam. This story we're going to tell you in 10 chapters and an epilogue. Well, in order to tell this story, we did actually go out on the streets and me and my, my friend James, who's running the, the cameras now, we, we took our places on a Buckfeets, a traditional uh, Dutch bike that is used to transport children. And what do we see here? We see the water. And of course, water is vital to this city because every single one of the houses you're now seeing was actually uh, founded on around 40 individual wooden poles dug deep into that marsh and sand, silt and water. And even as we look at this central station here of Amsterdam, that itself is founded on 13,000 individual poles driven down into the marsh. This really it shouldn't be then, from an architectural point of view, the sort of place you would build a city. But from a human point of view, it made it strangely attractive in the 1200s. In particular, for those people who wanted to dub themselves as independent and flee from authority into Europe's old Wild West. Because in the year 1200, that no man's land of Marsh fell perfectly between the rule of two local powers, the bishops of Utrecht down to the southeast and the counts of Holland up to the northwest. And so it was here that people thought they could get away from authority and make themselves rich. In fact, very soon they had established it as something of a tax haven with a little tax dispensation for all the trade going on there. And the big question I think people might ask about Amsterdam is, did it become this rich and influential city through that kind of individualism, that dynamic free trade capitalism, or was it through a more collective ideal? It's funny because we just went past Central Station, which actually represents a little bit of both. A little bit of innovation, a station seemingly out almost in the sea, but a little bit of a collective effort. And that is the grandest building you will see on this journey through Amsterdam. But it's a communal building. So how did that all start? Well, I have to take you to Dutch marshland. And Dutch marshland was drained away by Dutch ingenuity, the ingenuity of windmills. And these windmills tended to be founded upon the concept of monks working together. Now monks in particular were those across Europe who established the windmill and the watermill as a major technological advancement to make work easier. They believed that man was, or humankind was fallen, and because humankind was fallen, work was burdensome, and it shouldn't be. And so they looked to technology to help ease the burden, whilst at the same time engaging themselves with the work. And so windmills became the thing dotted across this countryside, and they became the thing 
that actually helped to drain the land. But where you've drained land, you also need dikes. Dikes are these big uh, bodies of land that are put together by groups of people to keep the water out. And when we think about these dikes, that takes us really into this concept of Amsterdam. Because you had these people who were being exceptionally free, yet who had to work together to keep the water out. There was, by its very nature, therefore, an element of independence and an element of tolerance. The people even came to the place where they decided to have their independent businesses all marketed together with one key idea of Amsterdam, the Emporium of Europe. When we look at this picture, what we can see is that, in fact, they were sort of saying, hey, here we are. We are the eBay. We are the Amazon of the Middle Ages. They actually literally said, first city of Holland, celebrated Emporium to all of Europe. Well, if we return to our little video, we're going to see a place that we've come to called the Zadike. And the Zadike uh, literally means the sea dike. And so this is one of those places that the Amsterdamers had to collectively upkeep together. But then we see all these individual houses. And this one is one of the two remaining old wooden houses in the heart of Amsterdam. Uh, we actually videoed it, and the day after we videoed it, it got hit by a truck, but fortunately not too badly damaged, so it's still standing. And this building is, is famous for being known as the Café Apia, uh, because apparently traders could exchange a ape or a monkey in exchange for a bed at night. And then we come along and we see this church. And this church is significant in indi indicating this connection with the sea, because this church founded in the 13 and 1400s was founded by Scandinavians. It's called St. Olaf's Capel, hardly a Dutch name. But it just tells us that right from that early foundation, Amsterdam was perhaps like San Francisco or Seattle, one of those cities on the edge that look out and are connected with the international world. Now, as we came down off this great uh, dike or kind of, you know, as the Dutch call them, the, you know, hills, uh, because it's such a flat land. Of course, we, we came across a few dogs, so we had to wait for the dogs to uh, get out of the way. Um, but eventually we got down, and what you can see is, again, we come into this sort of central canal area, and just these hundreds of individual houses, and each individual house would have been a business. And that's why you see, if you look at the roofs, you see these sort of hooks that jut out, because the hooks would be used um, for the fact that the upper floors of each house were warehouses. So you would have the family who lived low down, the workshop in the basement, and the warehouse for trading your own individual uh, goods up above. But there's another reason we're going down this street, because it wasn't just trade that put Amsterdam on the map. In fact, if I took you to the 1300s, the major maps of Europe were pilgrim maps, telling the journeys that pilgrims could go on through Europe. And here we come down, therefore, to the central church of Amsterdam. Much bigger than you might expect a small parish church to be, because, in fact, it did become one of these sites of pilgrimage. It's now called the Oudekerk, or Old Church, because in the Protestant Reformation they removed the Catholic name of the St. Nicholas Kirk, or the St. Nicholas Church. And uh, they also have another church, which is called the New Kirk, which is uh, a few years younger. Uh, so we can just see this sort of like inventiveness of, of names or the practicality of the Dutch, the old church and the new church. Well, how did this all happen? How did they get to that place of having uh, a pilgrim church? Well, the reason starts with a miracle. And the miracle is known as the miracle of Amsterdam. And it goes like this. One night in 1345, a man on his deathbed was given communion, but he happened to vomit the communion up. The lady who was serving him took away the communion bread and tried to burn it on a fire. It didn't burn up. So she took it to the priest to see what was happening. Strangely, it re-emerged in the same house. She took it again and it re-emerged in the same house. The priest concluded that indeed a miracle had happened and that the world should be informed. God clearly wanted the miracle 
of his body preserved from fire to be known around the world. And so it was that Amsterdam became a city based around a miracle. So it was that the pilgrimages started. And we can see here a painting of pilgrimage uh, going actually between the house where the, uh, the, the bread was vomited up, which became in itself a church, and the old church that we've just seen. So this pilgrimage would take place every year, bringing through the bread from one of the locations to the other. And what also happened in that sense was that around the pilgrim sites, Amsterdam became a monastic city. It became a city based upon monasteries. In fact, at one stage, there was one monastery for uh, every 500 people who lived in the town of Amsterdam. And so if we look uh, back to the map again, we can actually see with a little bit of a close-up uh, that we've got down in the sort of bottom corner here, that's the old church that we've just looked at, the Oude Kirk. But if you look up very close in the top left-hand corner, you can see quite a few areas with their own little churches and courtyards. That's because this became uh, uh, an entirely uh, sort of monastery-dominated city. But this actually also points us towards something else, which is that many cities in Europe were founded upon monastic ideas. In fact, the uh, Dutch scholar Erasmus put it that, what is a city but a huge monastery? And it's interesting because when you go around Amsterdam today, you can still see sort of monastic legacy. There are definitely streets named after the monasteries. There are uh, streets that indicate how the monasteries brought people into the city from all walks of life. Uh, there are streets that indicate that prayer was meant to continue throughout day and night, one called Chabed Zonde End, pray without ceasing. But there are also uh, many, many towers in the city, and the towers have their clocks on them. And this just indicates this whole thing that happened in Europe where life in cities became regulated by this clockwork business pattern that in some ways followed the clockwork pattern of prayer in the monastic system. So then we want to come on, we want to think, well, what then did this mean for the first Amsterdamers? So we come to our first painting of some Amsterdamers in the 1500s. And this unknown couple, you can see, are clearly business people. You can see them pointing down at money on their desk. But they're also pointing down at the fact that time is running out. Time is running out, and you can see here on the left, there is a skull indicating what it's running out towards. It's running out towards their impending death. But Jesus is there with hope of a better life. And in fact, the words on the back say this in summary, life is short, live honestly and as Christians, and if you are rich, you are duty bound to share your possessions. You get this whole concept then of the fact that Europe and Amsterdam in this period in the 1500s had got this uh, sort of regularity to it. And this regularity to it was also seen in the loose sort of start of a social care system. This sharing of the wealth by couples like this uh, meant that you could expect that people's bodies would be buried. You could expect that uh, the poor would be fed. In fact, if you were an Amsterdamer, you could expect that if you died, your children would be taken into city orphanages. So there was this kind of regularity uh, to life that was dominated by this religious point of view. It might sound all quite peaceful, but there was a change on the way. The same man who had made the quote about cities being like monasteries, Erasmus, was also a scholar who was to some extent a thorn in the side of the Catholic Church, despite being committed to it himself. He was to point out the corruption in the church and in his translations of the Bible to point out a rather dangerous idea that perhaps the Bible didn't say anything about paying penances, but in fact simply said that people needed to repent of their wrongdoing. Such an idea though was by no means the biggest thorn in the side of the church and Erasmus wasn't either. Instead, it was in another corner of the Holy Roman Empire where Martin Luther was to come up with the most dramatic ideas. He was to point out that payments could not get you into heaven. Penances 
could not get you to heaven. Priests could not get you into heaven. And if that was so, you simply had to trust in the finished work of Jesus and have faith. But surely that meant the wheels falling off of normal society. Surely that meant people could do pretty much whatever they liked. Well, there were certainly some radical groups, one of whom were the Anabaptists. And if I was to take you down to the KFC, a couple of hundred metres away, you would be at the location of one of the more curious incidents in Amsterdam's history. One night in 1535, the Anabaptists hit the streets. Now, Amsterdam might be famous for nakedness, but not particularly this sort. This was because the Anabaptists realised that their newfound freedom in Jesus meant that they shouldn't need to have clothes on. In fact, one woman was given a cloak by the local sheriff as she ran naked through the streets and told him, the image of God does not need to be ashamed. But the Anabaptists were even more radical like this. They attempted to seize the city hall, but failed. Their armed rebellion was met with harsh crushing. They were to find themselves beheaded, put in sacks and thrown into the rivers. They were to find themselves at the edge of the hard clampdown of Amsterdam upon this new religion. But the hard clampdown was by no means the standard response. Instead, we get back to this idea of gedogen, this idea that everything really kind of should be allowed because we need to get on. We're all going to be needed if the dikes break, so therefore we can do this. We can look through the fingers at what's happening. Gedogen, things might be illegal, but they're also kind of allowed. So it was that when the Holy Roman Empire said, Amsterdamers, clamp down on these new Lutherans, clamp down on these new Calvinists. The standard response of the Amsterdam mayor was to say something like this. This coming Sunday, we should all think upon the text, flee, to, flee from Egypt, by which he meant, everybody who's at one of these illegal meetings, maybe don't turn up this Sunday. I'm going to be sending the soldiers in. He could do his job, sending the soldiers in to clamp down, but there would be no real consequences for the people in those new religious groupings. Well, the Holy Roman Emperor was named Charles V, and he soon realised there was a problem with the Dutch. He told his son, we have seen and discovered that the people there cannot tolerate being governed by foreigners. His son, Philip, was, however, perhaps a little hard of hearing when it came to realising the consequences of this. He was also rather in need of money. So he decided to tax the money-producing engine that these merchant towns of Northern Europe were. In addition, he was a strict Catholic who decided to clamp down upon these new seeming rebels of religion. But he was simply adding fuel to the fire. And a literal fire was to start. Rather than accepting the clampdown, the Protestants of the North decided instead that they would attack the churches. All those statues and paintings, surely they were just idolatry. Surely they needed to be removed in order for the true God to be seen. For a brief time, the priests were on the run. And for a time, Amsterdam was unsure which side it was really on. Well, the Spanish had quite some persuasive powers. In particular, they sent an army. The Duke of Alva marched through the Netherlands with his troops. And as he marched, it was brutal. He was to go through cities and towns and massacres were to follow. Here we see the close by town, only a few kilometers from Amsterdam of Naarden, suffering from a famous massacre under the Spanish troops. But this was in fact the closest it would ever get to Amsterdam. Here they deliberately played the system, flip-flopping between whoever seemed to be in the greatest chance of winning. Until in 1578, they finally became Protestant. The monks and the monasteries closed, but it was a bloodless revolution. And it established a new basic principle. Faith 
can't be forced. With the Amsterdammers turning to Protestantism, they also joined what was known as the Union of Utrecht, a very simple conglomeration of various Dutch states. And in it, there was a basic idea. Each person shall remain free, especially in his religion. There was within Protestantism perhaps a basic assumption of freedom, because of course, if Martin Luther was right, faith couldn't be forced. It was a decision. Jesus had done everything. You just had to decide for yourself. Of course, there was another point of view, which was the Calvinist point of view, which perhaps indicated far less freedom, which was to say, but even that faith is a gift from God. So really, he is in control. But nonetheless, either way, the Calvinist or the Lutheran way, you couldn't force somebody into heaven through simply getting them to attend the right church at the right time. So it was that William the Silent, the Prince of Orange, when he came through Amsterdam, he was taken by the mayor past the holy church where the pilgrim bread had been kept. The mayor commented to him, do not worry, not one stone of this old Catholic worship place will be left standing. And the Prince of Orange replied, huh, no, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And the Duke of Orange was perhaps more onto the idea that was to become the dominant idea of Amsterdam. The idea that actually you had to tolerate things. And so it is that we see in Amsterdam in the subsequent years that it became something of a religious haven for religious rebels. Reluctantly, the city had rebelled, but now they were welcoming rebels from all across Europe. We can see, for example, here a Catholic church, seemingly a rather normal Catholic church or chapel, except for the fact that you've seen it already, but you would never have noticed. This is our Lord in the attic, a hidden church up in the attic of one of the houses we passed as we went on our bike journey down to the Outer Kirk. But this was just one of around 40 Schalkirchen, or secret churches, hidden around Amsterdam. Of course, people would know that those churches were there. They would have a concept that in fact there were people worshipping and not just at what was the official religion of Calvinism. But they would allow it. It was again Kredochen, illegal but allowed. And so it was that Amsterdam also became a haven for English people fleeing over the sea to establish their own new forms of religion. In particular, the first Baptist church was started in Amsterdam. And that Baptist church had a particular attendee a man called Thomas Helwys. Some 75 years before the Enlightenment can be said to have started, he actually established an idea that we often associate with the Enlightenment, that of a real concept of why freedom of religion should actually be established as a philosophical or theological requirement of a good society. He put it in a document known as a short declaration on the mystery of iniquity. And with this short declaration, he'd proclaimed to the King of England that he should no longer try to dominate people's religion. He in fact attached a little side note. And the side note said that the King is a mortal person, not a God, and therefore he in fact has no power over the immortal souls of his subjects. Now we might look at this and presume that this meant that guys like Helwys presumed that all religions were equal. Actually, we'd be wrong. It wasn't that they thought that all religions were equal, but, he thought, but they thought that they were true or false. And if the Christianity they believed in was true, then it could be shown to be such. Taking this idea further forward were a group known as the Remonstrants. Now, we're not going to do a theology lesson particularly today, but we can see a few of them. Here, Jacobus Arminius. Here, Simon Episcopius, and here Hugo Grotius, or Hugo de Groot. He is perhaps the most significant of the lot, not necessarily in theological terms, but in what he expanded as an overall view of the world. He was known as the child genius of Europe, 
And when he moved to Amsterdam, he was able to say, we don't need to force religion because in fact, Christianity is true. It's true by nature. It's true when we look at the true stories of the gospels as history. And it's provable by the actions of the early Christians as noted by Roman authors. And de Groot was interested in people's actions. He was in fact so interested that he also came up with another rather significant document. This document was not on the matter of religion, but on the matter of war. The law of war and peace. And within this document, he had put into uh, writing the first overall assessment of the idea that there should be rules governing war. Here, he pointed out that war should be necessary. War should be avoid killing if possible. War should only be conducted if there was a chance that you might actually win. Basing that on the ideas of Jesus, that you had to count the cost before taking part in an action. Now, de Groot was actually not to be the winner of the religious debate. Neither were the remonstrants. They were on the losing side. But perhaps that in that greater war that was taking place in Europe, de Groot was to have the more significant impact. He wasn't to see it in his own lifetime, but there were certainly elements of the Treaty of Westphalia in uh, the 1600s that ended the religious wars that actually came with some of the ideas that de Groot had put in writing. And in fact, today, if we look at what is taking place in terms of the way the UN might look at uh, the rules of war, we can trace it back to Hugo de Groot. We move on to our next chapter. Arriving at Amsterdam in the 1600s, it's worth us taking a look at the paintings of a man known as Jan van der Heyden. Here we see a city that seems to be relatively at peace. We look back at the outer kirk that we visited earlier, and we can see people unloading beer on the beer dock. It's still a city of trade. But also we see the rich and the poor alike on the streets. As Paul Spies, the director of the Amsterdam Museum put it, there was a Dutch mentality of modesty that formed Amsterdam in its own way. In other countries in Europe, where the rich had their own neighborhoods, the separation said, I'm the master, you're totally dependent on me. But we in Amsterdam had the Calvinist mindset, which said, we're all small people, none of us are gods. And so we see the people taking river taxis together, attending churches together. But the painter himself was perhaps even more dramatic an example of the new Amsterdam. Seeing the trouble of people falling in the canals, he decided to invent street lighting. Seeing the trouble of the buildings burning down, he decided to invent the first movable fire engine, a simple cart with water barrels, a leather pump, sorry, a leather hose and a pump attached to it. And as a result of that, the city was to be saved from quite a few fires. But what's curious about Jan van der Heyden was that he would never have been here in another city. He was a Mennonite, rejected by a variety of other cities, but one of those great Amsterdamers who never started in Amsterdam at all. Nonetheless, perhaps it's still not quite right to have this idea of a city entirely at peace. Jan van der Heyden's idea of a kind of peaceful city is not matched by this etching, which demonstrates a far more bustling city, and certainly anybody who's ever lived in Amsterdam knows that it, the bustling city is perhaps the right image of what it's truly like. We're used to this day to have tourists flooding our streets up until this lockdown and the fact that it's very hard for actually the locals to even move down their own pavements or sidewalks. But here we see the groupings coming to this city of merchants who had fled from other parts of Europe. We see Sephardic Jews in particular who had fled the Spanish Inquisition and found in this new city where faith couldn't be forced that in fact they could be Jewish not only by blood but also by decision in terms of their practice of religion. Yet can we say that this was truly a theological move? Of course not. We also look at this and we see that the Amsterdamers had realised something essential. Multiculturalism 
makes money. And that money was not always made because of a love and embrace. Instead, it was often made on the back of exploitation. And so we see here an example of slavery. Nonetheless, Amsterdam was seen to be a city of safety. For Jewish people, in fact, it has adopted over the years the name Mokum, or safe place, or safe haven. And Mokum is still what it's actually known as by its nickname to this day. We're going to look, however, at how that was hit by tragedy in the 20th century later. Nonetheless, in this particular period, it was these refugees, it was these immigrants, it was these groups who came from the outside that made Amsterdam a city of outsiders and has still meant that even to this day, it's got this edge that says, we do not wish to put into power those who are going to reject outsiders. But what actually happened in this period? Well, I think it's worth us thinking through boats. With the refugees came technology. Much as in the 20th century, refugees from Europe were able to go over to America and to contribute to NASA, so it was that a different journey, not to the stars, but to the other side of the world, was to be contributed to by the refugees coming from Antwerp, coming from Portugal, with maps and monetary systems, they were to set up Amsterdam as an even greater trading hub. Because after all, what's better than sending out one ship to do a job? Sending out a large group of ships. And this painting encapsulates the idea of a large group that did go. 15, in fact, set off to take part in the journeys of the Dutch East India Company. But another invention beyond charts was to come out of that adventure. It was the founding of the first stock exchange. At first the deal was being done literally directly ahead of where I'm speaking to you now, on the new bridge of Amsterdam. But soon they were to establish an actual stock market, inventively placing it over a canal. This stock market also indicates to us something that still remained. There was a basic idea that was required in order for a stock market to work. And that basic idea was that you could trust the piece of paper on which deals were written. Now, why could you trust them? Well, we've mentioned some of the biblical roots of the culture. But here, what you can see in the stock market are women trading. And this is incredibly significant when we look at the first attempt to do dodgy deals. There was, in fact, a man known as Le Maire. And Le Maire tried to make the most of this new stock market. And how did he do it? He did it through a thing known as short selling. His basic idea was to make sure that he sold shares with a future promise of delivery at a high price. In the in-between, deliberately he created rumours to devalue the shares in order to buy them at a low price. But of course, this didn't just help Le Maire's deal, it cut lots of people out of money, including those women and including children. Because Amsterdam, still with this business mindset in every house, had Amsterdamers who had invested in shares. Because they had invested in shares, it was possible that the company was able to turn around to the Dutch government and say, if you allow Le Maire's deals to go through, if you allow this devaluing to take place, the end result will be that widows and orphans will be defrauded. And the Bible says you must not do that. And so it was with well, this same basic system and same basic idea that the first financial regulation actually came into place. It's one of the things that is uh, fascinating today now when we look perhaps back on 2007, 2008, that actually the first free market had one set of principles behind it that actually required it to have one set of regulation. This idea also expanded in the way in which people were treated. And so the orphanages continued. Rich Dutch merchants were meant to contribute. And here you see an orphan from the lepers um, an orphanage in the city. Similarly, as the city expanded, there were dodgy deals on land. And it was a believer known as Kromhout who exposed the dodgy deals and who got celebrated 
for it. But in the end, this city was still a free city. If we look at this uh, painting, what we can see again is this uh, growing freedom of mind. And here we see something fascinating. It's a person reading the Bible, but not just any person, but a woman. And this tells us about how this was a thriving center in the 1600s, because there was a general idea that literacy was expected. If faith had to be a decision, then you had to be able to read the Bible. If you had to be able to read the Bible, then you had to be literate. And so we see that literacy spread across the population. In fact, as literacy spread, so did science. And here we see uh, Rembrandt's first sort of famous painting of a man called Dr. Tulp conducting an autopsy. And this was part of the overall idea that there should be regular scientific experiments that took place in the Newmarket, the center, uh, one of the central meeting places of Amsterdam. Well, if we want to think though of free minds, we really need to get to the ultimate. And the ultimate free mind was the owner of this one. Or of course we might ask, was he? Well, he was certainly the owner. This was an astrolabe, and it was actually a scientific uh, device that could tell you the time wherever you were by using uh, the uh, stars and the, the sun. But the owner was this man, who in fact might have questioned whether those things existed at all. He is known as René Descartes, and we must explain him using an apple. Now, Descartes was perhaps grabbing onto this overall idea that you needed to challenge authority. That same idea that we've mentioned with Erasmus or Luther, except the authority he was challenging was even the authority of his own senses. Descartes lived in Amsterdam for a brief time, but he spent much of his writing career moving from town to town across the Netherlands. And as he did so, he observed that Dutch dress that we just saw in the stock market picture. He observed people in cloaks and hats and he wondered to himself, if I only see their backs and not their faces, how do I know they're still there? How do I know they're simply not puppets being moved along? Surely I don't. Can I really trust my senses? Well, Descartes decided it was a little bit like a barrel of apples. When you have rottenness in the barrel, there's only one way to sort it out. You have to pick out each apple one by one, check it over, and put it to the side. Well, surely ideas were like that. You could examine every idea, see if the idea was correct, and if it was, keep it. If not, discard it. In the end, Descartes concluded there was one definite idea that could not be discarded, and it was simply this. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Now, from that starting point, Descartes was to go much further. And he was to, in fact, establish the idea that not only was he thinking, but therefore he must be a thinking being. And from there, he actually worked his way all the way back to God and all the way back to many of the basic ideas of science that we've already mentioned. But there was somebody who perhaps even better encapsulated the basic thing that was going on with Descartes which was that man, or the individual, or the person, was the measure of all things. Putting the individual right in the centre was something that a Dutch painter was great at. And we come on to Rembrandt. Rembrandt was the selfie king. He was the guy who came up with a self-image that he could portray to everybody else. A self-image that has seen him make uh, of such a wide variety of etchings that I couldn't possibly uh, take time to show you them all. But the one that I think is most curious is this one. Here we see a self-portrait, except he's not on his own. In fact, he's placed himself right in the middle of a scene that those Amsterdamers a couple of hundred years ago would have recognized. Jesus and the disciples in the storm. Well, Descartes 
certainly influenced the ideas of people around, as did Rembrandt. But of course, we can't just presume that what we think is actually going to always hold sway. There was another thing that was sweeping across the Netherlands, and it was the tulip fever. Much as the stock market had started, much as futures trading had happened, much as short selling had happened, so the first big financial bubble was to hit, and it was to be about tulips. The Dutch, with their newfound wealth, decided to invest, and many of them invested in tulip bulbs, with the most prized being the Semper Augustus, the most beautiful flower. This beautiful flower was seen as being so valuable that its bulbs at one point, it is said, were traded for the price of a house. Until, of course, the bubble burst. Well, we might look back and we might laugh at the idea of the bubble bursting. We might laugh at the idea that you would ever put that value to a flower. But there was one man who didn't laugh. He was another person who was, to some extent, an outsider. His parents had been Jewish immigrants arriving into Amsterdam, and he was known as Spinoza. He wasn't laughing because his aim, like Descartes, was to understand the world. And he said, I've striven not to laugh at human actions, not to weep at them, nor to hate them, but to understand them. Spinoza's aim was to truly understand what was happening. Because God, or nature, was all things and was in all things. The irony of this position was that in throwing off the old shackles, Spinoza had come to one conclusion. None of us then could actually be free. The only freedom we could really have was in realizing rationally that we weren't free. This of course was interesting because Spinoza on the other hand is also seen as being one of those people who contributed to the idea of freedom. He made an assessment in political philosophy of monarchy of aristocracy and of democracy, and concluded the system most likely to lead to the peaceful lives of people was, in fact, democracy. Perhaps for this reason we find his statue today right by the City Hall in Amsterdam. And as we look at it now, we're going to fly up over the city from the City Hall as it is today, up, and we're going to see the Outer Kirk, and we're going to go to the City Hall as it was in Spinoza's era, when it was founded in 1672. And this city hall tells us something also curious and interesting. It tells us that despite all these new ideas, ancient ideas were still dominant. Inside that city hall, you'll discover that the bankruptcy hall has above it an ancient Greek myth of Icarus, the person who had flown too high. The judgment hall has images of Solomon, the great biblical judge, and is surrounded by depictions of the Garden of Eden, talking about the idea that truly people's home should be with God. Yet on the other hand, when you look at this city hall and you look to the right, you can see that it doesn't rise, uh, sorry, that it does rise higher than the church. Surely the authority of mankind or humankind within Amsterdam was seen as being higher than the authority of the church. Nonetheless, Spinoza also had to face the fact that there was another authority that was coming under challenge. His belief in democracy also faced a crucial moment. In 1672, it was the disaster year for the Dutch republics. The French and the English combined together to attack. The dikes had to be flooded simply to save the nation. And the end result was that the heroes of the Republic, the Spinoza, those people who he had believed in, the De Witt brothers, found themselves attacked by a mob, hung upside down and disemboweled. Spinoza's belief in democracy, to some extent, had died. But ideas don't die. They just keep moving. We actually look at the city of Amsterdam and we can see that it was a city on the move. Here we have an image of John Amos Comenius, the first person to advocate universal education, the first person to come up with a textbook and his textbook was like we would recognize today, uh, full of both of written words, but also of visual pictures. He again was one of these refugees to the city coming from the modern day Czech Republic. Then we look at Adamantis Koraïs, another person who can be seen as a founder of a nation. He 
had put into uh, new uh, language the modern Greek dialect, and in doing so, uh, had challenged the authority of the Ottoman Empire. But it was another group, not to the east, but to the west, that were to have, perhaps, the biggest challenge. English people who did not agree with the English monarchy continued to arrive in Amsterdam, and perhaps none more famous than the philosopher John Locke. Locke famously said that new opinions are always suspected and usually opposed. It is then interesting that the place he decided to actually come was to Amsterdam in order to put forward a whole bunch of new opinions. In particular, and of note, was this basic idea that man, being by nature all free, equal and independent, no one can be subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. Now this idea was of course Locke's, but this idea spread somewhere else. It spread beyond the bounds of England, where it in fact had become to some extent the basis of the English Bill of Rights, to another place which is rather significant. And here we see a Dutch boat heading there. That place is the place that we now know as the United States of America. Now the first Dutch boat to head out there came from near, nearby this tower and it was actually captained by a man named as, known as Henry Hudson. He went from past this tower out to find a northern passage to Asia. Instead, he came across a river. The river was next to an island. The island was peopled by the Manhattan people and became known as Manhattan. The river, the Hudson River. Now Hudson was to be followed by many others. Down in this little church, the Vallonkirk, there was to be a couple married. And this couple uh, were to in fact become the basis of over a million Americans. Joris Rapale and Catalina Trico. They registered their marriage here, they left eight days later for the Americas in 1642, and now they have one million descendants among the American people. But there were also ideas that descended from this city. One of the ideas beyond John Locke was the idea of the Pilgrim Fathers. Now the Pilgrim Fathers, to be honest, didn't like Amsterdam. They soon went off to Leiden, and that is what they're often known for. But for a brief time they were here, and they used to meet in a meeting house that you can see from this picture. Here they would gather together to discuss in the afternoons what had Bible preaching meant in the mornings, an idea known as prophesying together, but also the basis of early democratic meetings. And of course, they took those ideas over to America. But we arrive back at our picture of the boat, because there are perhaps two founding myths of America. One is the Pilgrim Fathers, but the other, for many people, was that city that Henry Hudson went to, known at that time as New Amsterdam. And you see this city as a rather Dutch place. There it is with the Dutch style houses, there it is with the windmills. Close by were to be other Dutch towns. Brokelen was to become Brooklyn, Harlem, was to become Harlem, and the centre area of this new Amsterdam, which was the same as the centre area of old Amsterdam, De Wallen, was De Walstraat, what we now know today as Wall Street. But perhaps even bigger than the geography were the ideas. The ideas that you must have free trade. When the residents of New Amsterdam tried to get monopolies, the Dutch government wrote back and said, no, free trade is the maximum of the day. Stocks and shares, money must be king. On the other hand, when they wrote back and said, can we have one religion, can it be Calvinism? They were told, no, the king must be freedom of religion. Of course, they were also getting towards rejecting an actual king. That was because some years later, way after the city had been turned from New Amsterdam to New York, they would reject their new English king. Instead, they would head towards becoming a new republic. And one of the leaders of that republic was this gentleman, John Adams. He was to become the second president of America. 
but before he did so, he came to live in Amsterdam, ironically placing himself on the Kaisersgracht, or the King's Canal. He, within Amsterdam, tried to reach out, tried to get people to embrace the rebellion. The Dutch didn't necessarily respond. Nonetheless, Adams had a fairly positive attitude towards the nation as a whole. He said the origin of the two republics are so much alike that the history of one seems but a transcript from that of the other. Nonetheless, Amsterdam did not sink in as being his favourite place. Instead, he said it was the capital of the reign of Mammon, and it wasn't until he moved from the city down towards Den Haag that he was to have success. Instead, the Dutch were rather obsessed with not doing anything with the new American rebels that might lose them trade with the English. So it is that we arrive at the late 1600s and we moved into the 1700s and here we see a famous figure of the 1700s, Giacomo Casanova. Casanova visited the city in 1759 and was left lost for words at being sent to the theatre with the mayor's daughter completely unaccompanied. She in turn went on to kiss him. But it is also true that the easy virtue of the city often didn't have so much to do with any basic idea of easy virtue, but it had to do with the gods of lust and money. As Gert Muck, the historian, said, it had nothing to do with freedom, everything to do with poverty, despair and powerlessness. So it is that we'll turn to the red light district today. Here we are on another one of our bike journeys and we're looking at the Achterbergwall. This is the central street of the modern day red light district, where to this day you still have the idea that people are to be available for paid for sex. Now, as we come over the bridge, we can look and we see the Henry Hudson Tower to one side. This is where he left from to the Americas. And as we look across past all these beautiful uh, townhouses, we see on the other side the Newmarket. That's where Dr. Tulp did his autopsy. But we're going to head off more on the journey of sailors because this was a sailor city. And because it was a sailor city, it was also a city, as we've said, of a morality that allowed for a sexual commodities market to mirror the financial market. But this was by no means a free and fair market. In fact, poor uh, Dutch young men coming from the countryside, often fleeing famine, would find themselves put up in boarding houses. There they would be encouraged to build up debts with alcohol and gambling and prostitution, and then they would be sold for a period of their life to the Dutch East India Company. Going past this tower were 700,000 of them, and those 700,000 of that group, only about 200,000 returned, many dying along the way through scurvy, disease, or the simple rigours of hard work. Of course, these young sailors were also, whilst in the city, the customers of those women who were in prostitution, who themselves were often sold into the trade. And we have records of some who were literally passed along with their debts from one madam to another. But when it comes to the selling of people, nothing is perhaps more dramatic than this building, the West India Company, because Amsterdam had also involved itself in another sort of slavery, chattel slavery. And chattel slavery can be shown here by this image. The Bekstein, the ship that took slaves from West Africa off to the Americas. It was what was known as the triangular trade. Simply what happened was that they took things like guns and manufactured goods off to West Africa. That in turn, of course, helped to encourage feuding groups in West Africa who would sell individuals to the uh, company. The company would take them to the Americas where they would be placed on plantations, often for making things like sugar. The sugar in turn would end up back on the European market. And so it was that for the price of a sweet tooth, people were sold. It was something that uh, also took place 
in New Amsterdam right from the start. Yet it was something that John Adams also would have objected to. He was quite clear in saying that the re revolution would never be complete until the slaves were also free. Well, we arrive then at the fact that the golden age of Amsterdam was also an age of exploitation. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, we've seen it. We've seen that there was the exploitation of people for sex, the exploitation of people for work, the exploitation of people as slaves. There was also the exploitation of trade. And trade was becoming more curious in Amsterdam. It is perhaps a question of exactly when any society really realises that it's changed from the things that made it great. Well, in Amsterdam in the 1700s, it seems they also didn't realise. They found themselves still rather rich, but the profession had changed. Rather than being merchants, by 1742, the most common uh, occupation listed was that of investor. Perhaps the moment at which we can say that old Amsterdam finally fell is this moment. The revolution when the Dutch decided to side with the French. And here you can see them dancing round the freedom tree. Within years, they were to find themselves with a king, a French king, Louis Napoleon, the brother of Napoleon Bonaparte. And they in turn were to find that business had collapsed. By siding with the French, they had cut themselves off from that which made them truly rich. They had allied themselves with continental trade and not seaborne trade. And so we see here the stock market by the early 1800s rather empty. What would soon happen would be that they would have to make a change. The change meant that they would step in. The government itself would take over the colonial enterprise. Trade had perhaps never truly been free, but now it was clear that it was down the barrel of the gun. The VOC had been the largest company to have ever existed, but it had collapsed. It had always been something that had taken advantage of people, but that advantage was now to be seen now the Dutch government was in charge, and it was to be seen because of a work of art, or more to precisely, a work of writing. This gentleman, Edward Dowsdecker, was to write a book known as Max Havelaar, or The Coffee Auctions of the Dutch Trading Company. But he went by the pen name Mortatuli, I have suffered much. He used this phrase to describe meeting himself. I would like to meet myself sometime to see myself, but I have to be in an extremely good state of mind on such a day because I don't like unpleasantness. The relevance of this quote is that in fact, Multatuli, through his writing, revealed to the Dutch people exactly the unpleasantness that had been going on for hundreds of years. That same tolerance that we perhaps might have heralded was also a tolerance that meant that the idea of looking through the fingers also had a rather dire effect. When you looked through the fingers at what was going on with the VOC, you were deliberately making a choice to avoid facing up to the horrors. And the culture system, as it was known, was horrific. The people of Indonesia had taxes they were demanded to pay. The taxes stayed fixed, even if the harvest didn't, meaning that often it was a choice. Starve by handing over produce to the Dutch government, or die because of the barrel of a gun. Well, it is then that we arrive in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. It was a city which was perhaps not quite so radical as we now think of it now. When Van Gogh arrived at the city, he discovered that it was a place full of preachers and his wanderings around the city are marked by him talking about the different people that he went to watch preach. As we move into the 20th century, we also notice there are other giants arriving on the scene. Aletta Jacobs, the suffragette, was the first to really establish uh, the idea of a family planning clinic. Meanwhile, Abraham Cowper was to establish a new university in the city, 
and was to put into place systems by which the Dutch concept of freedom of faith would actually be turned into a concept that had some actual systemization, systematization through what's known as the pillar system. But if you want to know more about Cowper, I'm not going to tell you much more because we've done two whole talks on Cowper. So you can just check them out on the YouTube channel, one in Dutch and one in English. Where I want to take us is into the core of the 20th century. The Dutch avoided the horrors of the First World War because the armies had marched not through the Netherlands, but through Belgium. They perhaps expected the same in the later part of the 20th century. In the 1920s and 30s, Amsterdam was a vibrant city, expanding its social care housing, at the same time being a place of debate. Out on the new mark that we saw earlier, you could hear evangelists and communists and philosophers speaking. Amsterdam was surely a tolerant city, but what was it tolerant of? I don't think that we can really think about Amsterdam and what's happened in the later part of the 20th century without embracing what happened in the Second World War. The Nazi soldiers marched their way down the Amstel River that we saw at the start and they took the city not long after Rotterdam had been bombed. The result of this was that the city entered into the years of occupation. Now, there were many tragedies in that time. There were many examples of heroism in this, that time. But where we want to focus now is we want to take you down to a place known as the Holland's Schauburg, the theatre. This theatre was in the heart of the Jewish district of Amsterdam. And it was the place where people were taken to be registered for deportation, Jewish people. It's a place of heroism in the sense that out of this place, around 600 children were smuggled over the back gates by resistant mem resistance members. And uh, indeed, uh, perhaps in the comments, we, we might add a, a film you can watch about that. But on the other hand, this is also a place where we can say heroism was lacking. As we move down the street, we come across that thing that Amsterdam is also known for, tram lines. And what we see as we pass along these tram lines is that there are markers of the horror of the war. Out in this park, we can see there is an Auschwitz monument. But perhaps a different marker is the one we should really be looking at. The marker of the tram lines itself. Because on the nights of raids, it is said that the tram lines 8 and 6 and 16 and 24 would run regularly between the assembly points and the central station to take Jewish people off for deportation. The tragedy is that there's not a single incidence of a refusal to work on those nights by the people who were the civilians working on the tram lines. Amsterdam, in fact, was one of the worst places you could possibly be in the Second World War if you were Jewish. Alongside Poland, the per capita number of people who ended up being executed is amongst the two highest outside of Germany itself. And Amsterdam had a vast Jewish community. To the left, as we look up, we can see the Portuguese synagogue. As we come along the street, we're actually facing towards a street known as Jodenbreestraat, or the Jewish Broad Street. And as we uh, circle around, we're also going to see other synagogues. Now, did people try to resist? Well, yes, certainly some did. In fact, as we come down, we're going to see a marker to the uh, most famous period of resistance. In 1941, in the Noorderkirk, or the North Church of Amsterdam, a gru group of uh, particularly communists decided to strike. They said, demand the disbanding of terror groups, organise self-defence in factories and neighbourhoods, remove Jewish children from Nazi power, take them into your families, be of one mind, be courageous, strike, strike, strike. Because of this courageous moment, we're going to turn and we're going to see a statue to one of the dock workers. Unfortunately, however, after a few days of the striking, after the leaders were rounded up and brutally punished, the strike collapsed. <laughs> 
When we think towards what happened in the city, we therefore have to think towards the fact that resistance, while it was a marker of the city, was not perhaps as strong a marker as many Dutch people might have hoped. We come then towards another scene of tragedy. This uh, is the, the diamond uh, building, Gaslan Diamonds, uh, and it was one of the key uh, trade areas of Jewish people. And on this uh, street is also one of the other small synagogues. But we're actually going to turn away from this and we're going to come and look at a school. The school uh, is still an operating school today. Actually, it's the one that my children go to. Uh, but at this time, it was known as Jewish schools one, two, and three. Around 500 children uh, went to school there during the Second World War. The tragedy is that by the end of the Second World War, only a handful of those children were able to ever return to Amsterdam. As we move along the street, when we look towards the school, we have to think about this as a place of tragedy. We have small reminders of some of the old maritime history. Uh, up on the wall of the opposite building, we have a mention of in the Turks of Slav, uh, perhaps a commemoration of the fact that certain Dutch people would actually find themselves enslaved uh, by Ottoman trading uh, pirates or the Barbary pirates of the Mediterranean in the 15 and 1600s. But that's not what we're here to specifically look at. Instead, we want to look down at this plaque. Uh, there are many, many plaques like this littered across this Jewish neighbourhood of Amsterdam and they record a simple thing. They record a place where somebody lived. So we see, here wound Sarah van Gelder Pepper. Here lived Sarah van Gelder Pepper. Geb, geboren or born in 1896. She was gedeporteerd, deported out Westerbork to, to Westerbork and for Mord, which means murdered, on the 22nd of the 10th, 1943, in Auschwitz. Did people know? That is the question. And it is the question that perhaps has haunted some of the Dutch. Of course, there will be an argument to say there was nothing that people could have done. There's also an argument to say that people didn't really know what was going on. But that tragedy is led a little bit of a lie by what Anne Frank did know. Anne Frank, writing in her diary on the 9th of October 1942, wrote of deported Jews, we assume they are killed. The English radio speaks of gassing. Perhaps that is the quickest method of dying. I'm totally devastated. On the 9th of October 1942, most Jewish people were yet to be deported. Another tragedy is spoken of when we look at this quote. Concerning the Jewish question, the Dutch police behave outstandingly and catch hundreds of Jews day and night. Rauter, the head of the German police in Amsterdam, writing to Himmler. This is not to say that there was no resistance. In fact, Resistance did continue to grow through the war. Uh, at first, certain people wondered what should they do. In particular, the church uh, was led by this view of, well, we should surely obey the government. Others were led by the view of, well, we've always been a go with the flow tolerant society. So previously we tolerated the old government. Now we tolerate this new Nazi government. There were those in fact who even uh, became Nazis themselves. As the war progressed, a group from the church went out to see the theologian Karl Barth asked, should we be resisting this government? They were told, not only should you be, but in fact, you are obliged to resist this sort of deliberately anti-Christian government. Nonetheless, the tragedy of the war years, I think, did have a major impact. The tragedy was also to get worse, even for Amsterdamers themselves. Uh, in the hunger winter, they found themselves cut off from supplies and starvation stalked the streets. It's in this light, emerging at the end of the war period, 
that we see a generation who didn't want to be like the generation before. Looking at the period straight after the Second World War and trying to understand the mentality, we could do worse than looking at Albert Camus. The French philosopher based a novel, La Chute, or The Fall, in Amsterdam. He placed the drama in Café Mexico City. In his terms, on the Zadike, actually existed on the Valmustrat. In this story, we're told of a man called Clements. And Clements is a person facing his own failure. He had failed to save a woman who had fallen from a bridge. He had failed to act in the way that he imagined his own high ideals demanded that he act during the Second World War. And he finds himself way away from the high places that he believed he should be morally and even physically being a lover of mountains and instead in the heart of Amsterdam. Here he has to comment about the city by saying, I am living on the site of one of the greatest crimes in history. He in fact talked about the fact that the neighbourhood just nearby, the Jewish neighbourhood that we've just taken our little trip through, had been spaced out a bit by our Hitlerian brethren. Even more than this, Camus, when he looked at Amsterdam, described it like this. Have you noticed that Amsterdam's concentric canals resemble the circles of hell? The middle class hell, of course, peopled with bad dreams. When one comes from the outside, as one gradually goes through those circles, life, and hence its crimes, becomes denser and darker. Here we are at the last circle. So it is that when we look at Camus, we see this generation that simply had to say, where do we look for values? Where do we look for grounding? We are a generation who looks back upon failure. Camus, of course, is also famous for uh, a novel, The Myth of Sisyphus, and in that novel he almost captures the idea that you might have thought of with Spinoza. Is there any actual true freedom? Is there any actual ability to achieve anything? Perhaps, in actual fact, you simply needed to succeed by embracing the fact that you could not succeed. Another real insight into this attitude of Failure, loss, and rebellion is given by another author from the 1950s, Annie Schmidt. Annie Schmidt wrote Yip and Janneke, a famous story of Dutch children. In it, she also encapsulated this idea so clearly when she said this, never do what your mother tells you to do, then everything will be all right. And you can see that there was a generation coming up who really did believe this, a rebel generation who wanted freedom on a whole dramatic new level. The Provos were the best demonstration of them within Amsterdam. This group started in 1965, took on some of those great ancient Amsterdam traditions of rebellion. Rather like Multatuli, they used art to demonstrate where business was taking people away from morality. And you can see here they put on fire a statue that was put there by the tobacco industry. They also tried to do a moral protest when Prince Beatrix uh, got married to Klaus von Amsberg, a former member of the Hitler Youth. But really, their protest was very much like that Camus or Spinoza idea that actually in the end, nothing would be achieved. They were saying this, Provo realizes that it will lose in the end, but it cannot pass up the chance to make at least one more heartfelt attempt to provoke society. Provo wants to revive anarchy and teach it to the young. Teach it to the young they did, the city became a hippie city. But on the other hand, Provo didn't quite do things in this anarchistic fashion. Instead, they did some things that were rather forward thinking and demonstrated perhaps an idea of doing physical actions to make progress. So here, for example, we see what was known as the white bike scheme the first city scheme to have shared bikes available for all. Here then, in the 1970s, we see the electric car scheme, or the white car scheme. 
uh, well before Tesla, this is what you got if you wanted an electric car. But these were also cars to share. We get back to the idea of Amsterdam as this egalitarian city that looked at how you could act as a whole community together. And embracing this idea was the ultimate icon of the 1960s, John Lennon. He came to the city with Yoko Ono for their honeymoon to celebrate hair peace, bed peace, peace in the world and an end to the war in Vietnam. Why? Why would they choose this city? Well, you can see them here with a Provo white bike and you can see that they've embraced the idea of what was going on. Why Amsterdam, they were asked. Lenin replied. It could have been anywhere, really, but this is just one of those cities. You know, the youth thing and all that. And the beds here aren't all at all bad. Well, if we look at John Lennon, we see an example of a famous music star embracing this idea of the hippie radical Amsterdam that was emerging in the 1960s and into the early 1970s. But there was also a more earthy kind of music in Amsterdam. There were the Levensliches or life uh, song singers. And these also embraced this idea that actually an Amsterdammer was somebody who was normal, down to earth. There was the song, Geef me mar Amsterdam, that is mooier than Paris. Give me Amsterdam, it's more beautiful than Paris. With a classic line, I would rather be in Amsterdam with nothing than to be in Paris as a millionaire. Johnny Usterlitz also put it into clear terms when he described that Jewish district we've just talked about uh, where Rata Loplein is found. He said, it's moyen leilich tichlek, it's beautiful and ugly at the same time. Another philosopher uh, putting his ideas out there through songs. But there was a philosopher also emerging on the scene with a whole different view of the world. And the view of the world was a football view of the world. The philosopher was Johann Cruyff, a local but also an international hero. Cruyff, the local philosopher magician of football, invented a whole new football role, the false number nine, well before Lionel Messi and led the greatest football team never to win the World Cup, the Dutch football team of the 1970s. He could nonetheless claim that there was nothing greater than style, and he could nonetheless claim that he had founded a football ideal. It's like everything else in life. You need to look, you need to think, you need to find space, you need to help others. It's very simple in the end, said Cruyff. So curious that that idea was perhaps similar to the idea we saw right at the start, shared by those first Amsterdammers who were thinking, how exactly should our business impact upon the poor? Every single thing had to be part of a system that worked together. And so it was that Cruyff came up with the concept of Positiespel, everybody with absolute freedom across the football pitch, yet everybody contributing to one another. And freedom was the marker and the name of the day. Freedom and rights. As we look through the 1970s up to the 2000s, we can see a new drive towards the individual. The individual had the right to pay for and the right to sell sex. The individual had the right to get high in one of the many cannabis cafes. The individual had the right to marry people of the same sex as them. The individual had the right to housing and to squat in buildings of others if they were unoccupied. The individual had the right to die. And so it is that we can see somebody like John Green, the author who wrote the book, The Fault in Our Stars, saying, some tourists think that Amsterdam is a city of sin, but in truth, it's a city of freedom. And in freedom, most people find sin. But of course, there is a paradox. This wasn't necessarily a paradise city as as much a paradox city. Just as freedom was encouraged, so other people's freedom was impinged upon. When we think of Amsterdam, we surely think of Vincent. But in one era, you thought of Vincent Vega, the star of pulp fiction. And in this, he tells you how people viewed Amsterdam in the late 1990s. Vega puts it like this. If you go to Amsterdam, you can enjoy cannabis. Yeah, it's legal. But it ain't 100% legal. I mean, 
You can't walk into a restaurant, roll a joint and start puffing away. This idea of legal, not 100% legal, we've seen before. It's the idea of Chirochen. And Chirochen was spreading. But as it spread, so did perhaps the idea of Camus and that central area of hell. There was, in the 1970s, a spread towards more coffee shops and more cannabis. But at the same time, there was a spread of the illegal drugs trade. Such was the power of that illegal drugs trade that this city became known as the centre of European heroin, not just of European cannabis. Such was the horror, to some extent, of the sex trade that the city became known not just this, as the centre of uh, the selling of sex by adults, but also as the centre of child pornography. The US Customs Service, in fact, we went so far as to declare Amsterdam in 1984 the modern version of Sodom and Gomorrah. When I do tours of the city by foot, we go down the street we saw at the start, the Zadaik, and I've had occasions where people have actually stopped me who are of the older generation and have said, oh yeah, I remember this street in the 80s, I remember this street in the 90s, I came across one gentleman who told me all about accidentally driving down there, and within a few seconds, his uh, front windscreen being smashed by somebody trying to break into the car. Criminal networks began to take control of different areas of the city. Some, uh, such as the Hells Angels, began to dominate the prostitution and drugs industry. Some went to take bold steps, such as when Freddie Heineken was kidnapped. Heineken uh, made a slight joke about this. He uh, said, yes, when they kidnapped me, they tortured me. They made me drink Carlsberg. But a more telling line was when he pointed out that he was rich enough to go to the Caribbean, but he was not rich enough to actually feel safe any longer in his city. The cannabis cafes proliferated. But there was also another person who became rather famous in the city. It's interesting that at this time, various people who were famous died in the city. Chet Baker, the trumpeteer, fell from his hotel to his death. Herman Brod, the rock star, had the same fate from his hotel some 13 years later in 2001. Brod himself had become a friend of this lady, Major Aleida Bosshart of the Salvation Army. It is ironic that in this particular era, when we look towards all of the radicalism that took place in Amsterdam. That when Amsterdamers were asked to name the greatest Amsterdamer of all time in the 2000s, they named Major Bosshart, a Salvation Army Major who seemed to, in many ways, have rejected so many of those ideas of Amsterdam. As far as we know, living a spinster life of devotion to Jesus. On the other hand, she was probably the sort of religious person that Amsterdamers liked. She had what you might say was skin in the game. She didn't simply judge and reject. Instead, she lived in the red light district. She went to visit the women who worked behind the red light windows, famously once taking the queen with her. She spent her time with the homeless people and the drug addicted people. Even for those who looked at the city and thought, what did the city do in the era of the Nazi occupation, could look to Major Boschart as somebody who had received the Yad Vashem honour, as somebody who was noted by the State of Israel as having participated in a significant effort to rescue Jewish people, in particularly Jewish children, during the Second World War. With the death of Major Boschart in 2007, we've got to say that the city rightly might be looked as entering a period of introspection, wondering about what exactly had happened. We're going to have a little video and we look down at the city today. Here we see the red light windows at this particular moment on lockdown, but still in existence. As we circle around, we see the old canal houses once again on the outside of Vorbergval. And as we come through, we begin to notice a place known as the Bulldog Cafe. The Bulldog 
is one of those places that is a cannabis cafe. Actually, it was uh, part of a movement to try to set up alternative trade in the central red light district that wasn't connected to prostitution. But on the other hand, those two have become connected together, as often stag parties flood the city with the aim of getting high and later finding themselves behind the red light windows. That has brought a sense to the city that it is incredibly hard to be somewhere that is liberal, open to all sorts of ideas, open towards drugs and sex, when the other places around perhaps are not as open. How do you then stop people flooding in? How do you stop the tourists who are simply there as sex tourists from flooding in? And what about the people who come to work in the red light district? We come here to the statue of Bell, placed here as an example of a woman who is working in prostitution and to point out that those women should have their own rights. Yet at the same time, some people have pointed to Bell and have said, this doesn't actually fit within the image that we see entirely in the red light area. Instead, during the 2000s, as all of the red light area uh, operations became more legal, at the same time, the borders of Europe were opened up, leading to a rather big problem. How do you regulate a sex industry when in fact you can't uh, be able to regulate the locations the people are coming from? It was noted that uh, women from Eastern Europe were flooding into the red light district. In some occasions, such as women who had been shipped over borders into the EU from Albania, it was uh, discovered that many of the women were having exactly the same tattoos, indicating literal ownership by the same gangs. The period of introspection didn't just end at the red light district though. People also looked towards what was happening with multiculturalism in the city. Lennon had said, why not Saigon or Dallas if peace is the cause? He had observed in the 1960s, because if, because I'm dead scared of Saigon or Dallas, there's less chance of getting shot or crucified here. Yet it was in the 2000s that exactly that sort of event occurred. Before Charlie Hebdo or Samuel Paty was the death of Theo van Gogh in 2004. He had been making a documentary in which he criticised the treatment of Islamic women and he was stabbed on the streets of Amsterdam. Introspection continued. Could it be possible to actually have a city where there was everything free if for some people freedom meant that they were free to restrict others' freedom of expression? On the other hand, this has been a period where people have said, we, know, we don't want to reject outsiders, we just want to work out how to accept them better. It's also curious that many of the immigrant communities into Amsterdam have actually driven it back to some of its roots. Some of its roots are being a city founded in faith. So it is that when we look at the southeast of the city, we can see a district in which they did the building work, presuming that the church was a dead and dying thing. And yet it is one of the areas of Europe with the most flourishing new churches. And we see it here with a rather large celebration of the life of Jesus, known as the Passion, which takes place on Dutch TV each year, but celebrated in the southeast of Amsterdam. The result of this, people have said, God is terug in Amsterdam. God is back in Amsterdam. Yet there is one group who are definitely still not necessarily welcome the tourists who flood the red light district, the tourists with their selfie sticks, even the people who have come to provide the music to which they dance to, such as Martin Garrix, the Dutch dance music producer, has said, the thing is, people only care about their selfie. Whilst Armin van Buren has pointed out, everyone is connected, but no one is connecting. On the one hand, you have a city which is flooded with tourists. Seemingly, they bring a lot of money in, but people are fed up. People are fed up with the idea that this is just some sort of adult themed Disneyland. People are fed up of the idea that you can get anything you want in Amsterdam and it doesn't matter about the local residents.
Ironically, the local residents in this city also face a problem. Even though it's a city of connection, it's been established in recent surveys that one of the biggest problems for the city is the issue of loneliness. And so there we hit it. We hit our city, the paradox city. The city that is totally free, yet the city in which people feel unconnected. The city that is very individual, yet the city which demands community. The city which embraces every philosophy, yet seems to return to the same one so often. Thank you for joining us on the tour.